We're going to begin this episode a, a bit differently from how we usually do. We're going to play a little game. Actually, calling this a game may not be the best terminology, so we'll just call this an exercise. So here's what I need you to do. I need you to, in your head, pick a number between 1 and 5. Got it? Okay, now if you really want to experience the hardcore version of this little exercise, then I would need you to go around to pretty much everybody around you, your family, your friends, random people on the street, that clerk at the gas station who you just got in a fight with, everybody, and every single one of these people would also have to pick their own number between 1 and 5. But if you'd rather skip the more complicated version, then okay, l l let's move on. Now that you have that number, here's what it means. Now, keep in mind that this isn't a real-life prediction. This is just a little example situation we're playing with. Okay, if you picked the number one, I have good news for you. You're going to be okay. You're going to live at least through the next few years. If, however, you picked the number two, you're going to get really, really sick. And in maybe about eight days or so, maybe less, you're going to die. If you picked the number three, then you too are going to get sick, except this time you'll be gone in about three days. And if you pick the number four or five, good news, you live to see another day. Now this is one thing to imagine, but as soon as you put this stupid little algorithm to an entire population, it doesn't take long before you realize all of civilization is going to be hanging by threads with this amount of lightning-fast death. Families are going to be torn apart, villages will be wiped out, government, trade, commerce, religious ceremonies, war, every aspect of day-to-life, day-to-day life is going to be flipped on its head. Well, if the title didn't give it away, yes, today's episode is going to cover the Black Death. In the middle of the 14th century, the Black Death, or bubonic plague, swept across Asia, Europe, and North Africa, killing anywhere between one-third to half of the population in these regions. And the plague would achieve this level of destruction in mere months. Historian Robert Gottfried regards this outbreak of the plague as a worldwide catastrophe so large in scale and consequence that only the world wars could ever match its level of destruction. This was not a plague, this was an apocalypse. And think about this, think about where we are in this podcast, the narrative we're going through. Massive levels of death and destruction and civilization collapse have already been happening worldwide. The Mongol invasion was an apocalypse of its own. We spent the last seven episodes or, or so just scratching the surface of the utter havoc that the Mongols and the heirs of the Mongols unleashed upon the world. And now, just as the Mongol hurricane is starting to subside, just as the world is starting to pick up its pieces again, just as the various government systems are able to stabilize, then the worst plague in the history of humankind comes crashing down, crashing down on everybody. This is the Timmer Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Timmer Podcast. My name is James and I'll be your host and companion as you and I go back to understand the story of Timmer. We will examine his life, character, and conquests as we seek to understand who he was and why he did what he did. Now, if you're new to the podcast, first of all, welcome. I'm glad you're here. But you may notice that we, has, we haven't as of yet actually arrived to the onset of Timmer. The past few weeks, or months, or years, or however long this thing has been going on, we've been going back to look at the story leading up to Timur, namely the Mongol conquests, the Mongol Empire, and the split of the Mongol Empire into its four parts, or Khanates. We are now making our way through each of these four Khanates because each of them plays a pretty big role in the world and story of Timur. We looked briefly at the Yuan Dynasty in China, the Golden Horde, the Ilkhanate, and next week we will examine the fourth and final Khanate, the Chagatai Khanate in Central Asia. But before we can get there, interrupting our journey, interrupting history, is the worst plague in human history, the Black Death. Now, before we jump into this pretty bleak topic, uh, two quick things. First of all, 
Uh, I want to make sort of an apology to my friend Trevor at the History of Persia podcast. If you're not familiar with the History of Persia podcast, you need to stop listening to this one and go listen to, to the History of Persia. It is a fantastic podcast that covers basically the whole story of the ancient Persian Empire. He, he can explain it better than I can, obviously. But also, Trevor has by far been the most helpful other history podcaster. I didn't write this down, if you can't tell. He, long story short, he's really helped me with just kind of the basics of history podcasting, because I have no idea what I'm doing, and he's been really helpful to just to helping me. Uh, this These sentences are horrible. Anyway, I highly encourage you to go check out the History of Persia podcast. It's it's well worth the listen. You can find out all about it at the History of Persia podcast.com. So listening back to this section while editing, I noticed that I never explained what this apology was for. Uh, so here's basically an explanation. I was supposed to send Trevor something about 38 years ago, and I still haven't sent him the file, and he has been very gracious and patient about it. So thank you, Trevor. I will get it to you soon. And, and yeah, listen to his show. It's well worth a listen. The second quick uh, announcement that I have is that I actually had a listener reach out to me this past week, uh, just telling me what she thought about the show, and also asking a really good question about Mongol history. Now, I'm not going to tell you what the question was, but uh, I've been kind of thinking about it and th the different ways to approach it just the past week, and I decided that the best way to answer it would be just to make an entire sort of bonus episode about this question. And it's it's going to be really interesting. I'm going to try and get that out in the next couple of weeks if I have time. Uh, but I won't give it away, but it's you combine medieval history with conspiracy theory, it's going to be a great topic. So hang, hang in there for that. Uh, I'll let you know when I, I hope to release that, but it should be interesting. Anyway, with all that out of the way, I think we can get into the details. I want to begin this investigation with a quote from an Italian chronicler named Villani from the city of Florence. And Villani is, as he's watching thousands of people die around him, he's recording this devastation that has just fallen upon him and his city. And he uses these words. Having grown in vigor in Turkey and Greece, and having spread thence over the whole Levant and Mesopotamia and Syria and Chaldea and Cyprus and Rhodes and all the islands of the Greek nation, this said pestilence leaped to Sicily, Sardinia and Corsica and Elba, and from there soon reached all the shores of the mainland. The bodies corrupted the air to such an extent that whoever came near the bodies died shortly thereafter. And the priest who confessed the sick and those who nursed them so generally caught the infection that the victims were abandoned and deprived of confession, sacrament, and medicine, and nursing, and many lands and cities were made desolate. And the plague lasted until... In case you didn't catch that, Villani leaves that last sentence open-ended so that he could come back and fill in the year in which the plague would hopefully end. But he never did. By 1348, Villani had been swallowed by the disease and killed, leaving this record of the plague forever unfinished. And if this quote isn't the most foreboding and terrifying four-sentence record of the plague, then I don't know what it is. So now let's get into what the Black Death actually was and what it did. The Black Death is a plague caused by a bacterium we now, and only since recently, identify as the bacterium Yersinia pestis. Yersinia pestis has been around for thousands of years. It's actually still around today, still causing outbreaks of versions of the Black Death in developing nations. Although the plague is readily tra treatable today with antibiotics, it's actually still deadly. In some cases, with antibiotics today administered, the plague can still have an alarming 10% mortality rate. So file that piece of info in that brain filing cabinet of reasons I won't sleep tonight. Anyway, the plague has been around, and always around, for a very, very long time. However, there have been three major outbreaks of this plague in history. The first of these outbreaks is what we today refer to as the Plague of Justinian. The Plague of Justinian occurred in the year 541 and 542 CE and ravaged the Byzantine and Sassanid Persian empires. 
It's always near impossible to get a death count for plagues, but estimates for the Plague of Justinian range anywhere between 25 and 50 million people dead. Depending on which number you see, this was a horrifying 13 to 26 percent of the world's population at the time gone. This was the first large outbreak. Skipping the second, the third outbreak of the plague actually, and this is horrifying, actually took place quite recently. This plague is often referred to as the Plague of Hong Kong or simply the Third Plague Epidemic. And this epidemic, although inflicting fewer casualties, lasted far longer than the other two, lasting from 1855 until 1960. And it killed anywhere between 10 and 12 million people in China and India, but mostly in India. That was the third outbreak. But the second outbreak, the outbreak that we're going to cover today, was far worse than the others. In fact, you could combine the first and third outbreak, and the second outbreak would still be far worse. Now, before we get into the effect it had on the Middle East and Europe, I know what you want to know. I know you want to know what the plague did to its human host. So this is what the Black Death did to humans in the 14th century, and I warn you, if you're squeamish, you may want to skip the next few minutes. If you became infected, you very well may not even know it for some time. This was the incubation period, and could last anywhere between one to nine days, although medieval sources make us believe that it was probably towards the shorter end back then. But during this incubation period, you may feel a little off, a bit sick, but otherwise probably normal. But it's already over for you and you just, you don't even know it yet. Further, you're likely already passing the plague on to the loved ones around you and you don't even realize that either. This is the incubation period. After this, you get sick and you get very sick very fast. Fevers, chills, heavy congestion, migraines, hallucinations, unstoppable sweating, your fingers and toes literally dying, turning black and maybe even falling off in a few cases, the coughing up of blood, and this is the light stuff. The real agony begins with the arrival of swollen lymph nodes, usually located in the groin or armpits. These swellings, well, there were often several of them. They were absolutely agonizing at all times. They often turned black in color. Sometimes they would leak blood or burst into bile, blood, and who knows what else. And they were large. If you were lucky, and I use that word very, very loosely, if you were lucky, these swellings might be the size of an acorn. But more often than not, they would grow to the size of an egg or an apple. These swellings were often called bubos, which comes from the Greek word for growing, as this is where they most often occurred. And yes, this is where we get the term bubonic plague from. Once you had these symptoms and were immersed in this constant world of trauma and agony, the only good news is that you'd be dead within 10 days. And once again, medieval sources seem to indicate that it was usually far less than 10 days, probably even within three days back then. But realize what this means. In less than two weeks, and actually probably much less than two weeks, you will have encountered the plague, no doubt spread it to people around you, gotten sick with immeasurable amounts of pain, and then would die. So now that we know how this horrifying thing works, where on earth did it come from? Well, there is actually quite a bit of contention about this, but from what I've read, there are two main theories that most historians and scientists seem to fall behind. Some think that in all three outbreaks of the Black Death, the plague began somewhere in China and then spread westwards. The other theory is that in regards to the second outbreak, the Black Death, the one we're covering today, it began either on the Mongolian steppe or in the Gobi Desert. So take your pick of whichever theory sounds better to you, but what we do know is that the bacterium Yersinia pestis flourishes in the bloodstream of fleas. Then when those fleas bite other animals, usually various types of rodents, infected blood is regurgitated into that animal from the fleas, and congratulations, now things have gone from 1 to 100 really quick. And to make matters worse, on the Mongolian steppe there are a lot of rodents. And this means that you're going to have infected rodents carrying the blood of infected fleas. Now, what's interesting to me is that there are old tribal traditions among various nomadic peoples on the steppe that seem to indicate that there was at least some knowledge of 
hey, those rodents are dangerous. There were sometimes rules about not keeping any rodents as pets or livestock. Uh, there was a rule about the importance of shooting them at a distance if they seem sick. You don't eat them if they look sick. Things like this. So things like this, they, they do seem to support the theory that the plague originated on the steppe. Either way, the infection eventually somehow passed to humans. Fleas much prefer rodents to humans, but they are not picky eaters. And so eventually the Black Death hopped over the animal to human barrier, and that's typically where things go to hell really fast. From a few Chinese sources, the plague seems to have broken out in Mongolia sometime in the early 1330s and devastated much of the population there. After this, the plague very quickly traveled southwards into China, and in the late 1330s, the plague started to move west. Now, there are, again, two theories on how the plague moved. The first is that the Mongols themselves were the primary reason it spread. Remember, although the empire has long split into the various khanates, roads and trade and warriors and couriers and pilgrims are still traveling all throughout the Mongol khanate lands. The Mongols had brought in a huge boom of trade opportunities and travel because of their empire. By the way, I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but this period is often called the Pax Mongolia, that is the Mongolian peace. Although I'd argue that this was definitely on its way out at this time. But regardless, there is still this huge and busy network all throughout Eurasia of human travel and movement. And if you have a Mongol warrior or a merchant in Mongolia who becomes infected and now he has to go west to fight the Chagatai Khanate or trade in Kiev or something, he's taking the plague with him. The second theory about how the plague moved is that climate change was pushing hordes of these infected rodents and smaller animals out of their native regions to search for new grassland and food. Climate change was a very real thing in the 14th century, along with an intense set of flooding, famines, plagues of locusts, earthquakes. Just not a good time to be alive in general. But anyway, with these animals moving west, seeking new sources of food, they took the plague with them. The plague was then passed to whatever humans were living in the area, and the rest is history. Now, most people tend to agree that it was probably a combination of both of these theories. Fleas were passing it to other fleas, animals to other animals, humans to other humans, and then a ton of intermingling sharing between those groups. Long story short, creating this destructive cauldron of carrier hosts. But anyway, so the plague moves and it moves fast. And what doesn't help the f is the fact that right now, in the mid-14th century, there is more international trade and travel going on than, well, since the days of the Roman Empire at least, maybe more trade and travel than ever before. So the death just explodes in all directions, carried by travelers and merchants and soldiers, oftentimes carried by people trying to flee it. And what's so utterly terrifying about the plague's movement is that A, it is unstoppable, and B, it's happening at a horrifying rate. Five miles per day in some areas, even faster in other areas, and nothing can stop it. It's always moving forward, it's always moving closer to you. 1339 is the year where we have clear evidence linking deaths of people to the Black Death. A small community of Nestorian Christians in uh, what's today Kyrgyzstan was hit. And it's here that we find tombstones lamenting the fact that plague has taken the deceased. And this is only the beginning. In that same year, outbreaks occur all throughout Central Asia, tra traveling through what's today Uzbekistan, Pakistan, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, plunging into Iran, all of the major cities in these regions or should I say, the cities that had just barely recovered from the Mongol conquests just a few decades earlier, all of these major cities become death traps. And this actually includes a city called Samarkand. This city, if you're unaware, the city of Samarkand will one day be the capital of an empire ruled by a man named Timur. Now, oddly enough, in the early 1940s, what am I saying? 1340s? Okay. Oddly enough, in the 1340s, early 1340s, the plague seems to sort of halt for a few years in Central Asia. 
but unfortunately this is not permanent. And a few years later from Central Asia, the plague shoots westward. Syria, Armenia, Georgia, the Caucasus, Iraq, Western Iran. By 1345, the capital of the Golden Horde Khanate, the city of Sarai, is hit and hit hard. By 1346, rumors start to hit the Christian world that a great mortality has overwhelmed the Islamic and pagan worlds to the east. One of these Christians who heard the horrible stories recorded this rumor that was now spreading like wildfire. He, he panics and says, India was depopulated, Tartary, Mesopotamia, Syria, Armenia were covered with dead bodies. The Kurds fled in vain to the mountains. In Caramania and Asia Minor, none were left alive. This wasn't true. There were many still alive. But his words give us this sense of a panic, of impending doom that is spreading before the plague even gets there. And this causes human movement. And human movement becomes a highway of contagion. By 1347, the Black Death had swept through Anatolia, which is modern-day Turkey, roughly, and then hit straight into Constantinople. The Byzantine Empire was already on its last leg, and had been for centuries now, but the plague is without a doubt one of the final nails in the story of the Eastern Roman Empire. At this point, the mighty city of Constantinople had anywhere between 100 and 250,000 people, making it one of the largest cities in the world. But within a year, anywhere between 40 and 50% of the population was dead. One Venetian traveler said that as many as 90% of the population died here, which certainly isn't true. But again, this shows how overwhelmed the survivors were with this overwhelming amount of death. But the Greeks were far from being the only ones who were dying. In fact, at this point in time, the plague's borders were already far beyond the westernmost and southernmost Byzantine lands. Two years earlier, in September of 1345, up to the north, disaster hit the Crimean Peninsula. Now, a bit of context. Merchants from the mighty city, the, the trade city of Genoa in Italy, had set up trade connections with the Mongols and the Turks in the city of Kaffa on the Crime Crimean Peninsula. And the Crimean Peninsula is that triangle-shaped peninsula that juts into the Black Sea. It's pretty easy to uh, identify on a map. Now, the city of Kaffa, which was on this peninsula, quickly had bloomed into one of the richest and most tr uh, important trade cities in the region and had large, po large populations of Turks, Mongols, Italians, and all sorts of other people living in the city. But in 1345, a dispute arose between the Genoese and the other people uh, living in the city of Kaffa, and this dispute led to a brawl. The brawl led to a citywide riot and resulted in the Genoese kicking the Muslims out of the city. Now, many of these Muslims were understandably angered by this, and so they fled to Johnny Beg. Johnny Beg, the ruler of the Golden Horde at this time, was told what had happened, and he was infuriated and quickly marched his army to Kaffa and began a siege of the city. Again, he allowed the Italians to, to live in the city and to trade there as long as they kind of you know, were subject to him. And now with this rebellion, that's no longer the case. So Johnny and his Mongol warriors attack the city, they besiege it, and that's when the plague hits. Very soon, his army crumbles into death as the plague decimates his soldiers. And it wasn't long before he realized that even if he did get into the city, he just wouldn't have enough men left to take it. So he orders that his troops retreat. But before doing that, he also orders that the dead, infested corpses of his dead soldiers be loaded onto catapults and launched into the city. And this was done. And as you can imagine, plague then spread like wildfire, brutally slaughtering the Genoese trapped inside. With the Mongols on the outside and the plague on the inside now, the Genoese decided to take to their ships and sail for home, which they thought meant safety. Now, a quick side note, there has been quite a, a bit of debate recently about this occurrence. While it's generally agreed upon that this city of Kaffa was where the plague got its foothold in the door to Christian Europe, there is a debate about how. I, man I mentioned the traditional theory that catapults were used to launch the dead infected bodies into the city, but the other popular theory is that infected country rats intermingled with uh, city rats and then those city rats brought the plague up from the sewers into the city. Possibly it arrived from a combination of both these theories, 
But the 14th century bio-warfare makes for a more interesting story, so that's what I decided to use. Anyway, back to the Genoese. The survivors got onto eight ships and sailed for home, but it was too late. It's difficult to run from something you can't see, and these refugees were already hosts. In October of 1347, only four of these ships reached the city of Messina on the island of Sicily. The inhabitants of the, of the island refused to let any of the Genoese onto the island, seeing them dying on the ships. This was a wise decision, but pointless. The plague had already bounded over the waters and onto the Sicilian beaches. Sicily was now infected. The Genoese, forced to leave, then set sail again, trying to get home, trying to get to safety, trying to survive, but not knowing what they carried with them. In December of 1347, the battered and almost unmanned ships limped into the port of Genoa. Most of the sailors were dead, and many who were still alive died soon thereafter. And now the plague had a home in Italy. The year is now 1348, commonly referred to as the Year of the Plague, because by 1348 and the following year of 1349, most of Europe, North Africa, the Middle East, the Steppe, Central Asia, and China will be overwhelmed with the Black Death. As you've probably heard, Europe was hit particularly bad. The plague cut through Italy, Spain, France, Germany, England, Scotland, Scandinavia, Hungary, the Balkans, and in most of these places, the death rate was often between 35 and 50 percent, with some places suffering as much as 70 to 80 percent dead. Oddly enough, though, the plague moved in rather peculiar ways. Often, it would seem to bypass entire cities or regions. Sometimes it would loop around and hit those same regions years later, and sometimes it would just leave an area alone altogether. And so you have these weird instances that scientists are still trying to figure out, like how come the Italian city of Milan was almost left untouched during a time when all the other Italian cities were death traps? Or why did Belgium and the Netherlands also have low death rates compared to their neighboring places like France or Germany? Why was Iceland left untouched until an entire 50 years later when they had their own awful and deadly outbreak? And perhaps the, str the strangest fact is that places like the Baltic states, Poland, and various Russian cities were hit last despite being so close to the Golden Horde. Which, remember, it was most likely from the Golden Horde Mongols how the plague got to Europe. But needless to say, the plague's impact on Europe was devastating. Every aspect of religious, civil, agricultural, militaristic, and social structure was shook to their cores. All in all, it's impossible to know how many people died in Europe, but modern estimates usually hover anywhere between 40 and 45% of the population dead. And if you want to know more about the plague in Europe, I'm not going to tell you. You can easily find other resources or even other podcast episodes on it, but what we're primarily interested is the impact the plague had on Central Asia and the Middle East. After all, this is well that will be the, where the story of Timur primarily takes place. So let's head over east, back up a few years, and take a look at their situation. The Middle East and Central Asia, which again, you'll often see these places just wrapped up with the phrase, the Islamic world. Well, the Islamic world was hit hard by the plague, no surprise there. And interestingly, the impact of the plague here sort of harkens back all the way back to episode one, when we talked about the difference between settled societies and nomadic societies. Both of these types of societies were very prevalent in the Islamic world. They were usually overlapping. Both suffered from the plague, but both suffered differently. As you might expect, Bedouin tribes that spent the vast majority of their time isolated in the desert or on the steppe had this sort of protective bubble around them. Fleas, rats, and yes, other humans wouldn't be able to actually get to these nomadic peoples much of the time just because of the difference in location. And so many of these groups were able to segregate themselves from the plague-infested populations. One North African historian noted that the Berbers, who are and were a nomadic people living across North Northern Africa, they were almost untouched by the plague because they saw what was happening in the cities and they thought, no way, we'll, we'll just keep to the deserts where we flourish anyway. However, the cities became death traps. The mighty city of Alexandria in northern Egypt was infected by 1347, possibly by a Venetian trade ship that was fleeing the plague and unknowingly carried it with them. 
But now it was too late. The plague was in the land of Egypt, and people started to die. At first, about 80 people died every single day. Then it became 90 people. Then 100. And by the end of the next year, the year of the plague, 1948, about a thousand people were dying every single day in Alexandria. The city was hit so hard that it wouldn't reach its pre-plague population until the early 1500s, more than 150 years later. But remember, the mid-13th century is the golden age of the Mamluks of Egypt. They have crushed the Ilkhanate Mongols at the Battle of Ain Jalut. They have regained lost territory from the Crusaders. They are pushing their borders into Libya and Ethiopia and the Levant. And what does this mean? Trade and travel are at all-time highs. And so the plague just catapults south up the Nile River to the fantastic city of Cairo, which is, at this point, one of the largest and most powerful cities in the world, with as many as 500,000 citizens. But now, death is here. Roughly 15 years later, a man by the name of, and I apologize for almost certainly saying this wrong, but I'm going to try anyway, Ahmad ibn Ali al-Makrizi was born. Al-Makrizi was an Egyptian who meticulously documented the history of Mamluk Egypt. He's one of the finest sources we have on the Mamluk period. So while Al-Makrizi wasn't alive for the plague, he no doubt met survivors and wrote down what they lived through in Cairo and other Egyptian towns as well. Here's what he has to say about the event. By January 21st, and that is of uh, the year 1348, the year of the plague, by January 21st, Cairo had become an abandoned desert, and one did not see anyone walking along the streets. Debris piled up in the streets, everywhere one heard lamentations, and one could not pass by any house without being overwhelmed by howling. Cadavers formed a heap on the public highway, funeral processions were so many that they could not file past without bumping into each other. And with this amount of death, chaos, anarchy, and violence has descended upon the city. And what doesn't help is that the Mamluk Sultan, so terrified by what's happening, he and his top guys flee the city. And I don't blame him. Society is shattering apart. al makrizi continues. He says, The plague emerged at the end of the season when the fields were becoming green. How many times did one see a laborer at Gaza or Ramla or along other points in Syria? The man guiding his plow being pulled by oxen suddenly falls down dead, still holding in his hands his plow while the oxen stand at their place without a conductor. The soldiers and their valets le left for the harvest and attempted to hire workers, promising them half of the crop, but they could not find anyone to help them reap it. He later goes on to describe that the Mamluk military also suffered, and remember, Mamluk Egypt is still at war with the Ilkhan Mongols. The Ilkhanate is, yes, about to collapse, but the Mamluks need soldiers. But al makrisi he describes how the officers in the army keep on dying, so they're replaced. Then the replacement dies, so a new replacement comes in, then he dies. And this happens in some cases as many as seven or eight times until literally unskilled and untrained shoemakers, tailors, farmers are being conscripted, promoted, equipped, and made into Mamluk officers even they, though they have no idea what they're doing. But this doesn't help the economy at all because the economy needs every single person it can hold on to because everybody is dying. He later goes on to say, Most of the trades disappeared. The price of linen and similar objects fell by a fifth of their real value at the very least, and still further until one found customers. Thus the trades disappeared. One could no longer find either a water carrier or a laundress or a domestic. The monthly salary of a groom rose from 30 coins to 80. Of an estimated 500,000 people living in Cairo before the plague, 200,000 would die. 50 people died a day then 100, then 300, and merely by the next month, as many as 3,000 people were dying in Cairo every single day. Egypt was ransacked. To the west, uh, the city of Tunis, in modern-day Tunisia, was also hit hard by the spring of 1348. At the height of the plague, a 1,000 people in the city succumbed every day. 
the renowned poet, and I know I'm going to say this wrong, so I apologize, Abu i Qasim ar Rahawi, wrote of the catastrophe. One of his poems reads with this. Constantly I ask God for forgiveness. Gone is life and ease. In Tunis, both in the morning and evening. And the mornings belong to God, as does the evening. There is fear and hunger and death stirred up by the chaos and plague. In Syria, the city of Antioch suffered as well. Half of the population disappeared. Baghdad, which was still in heaps of rubble after the Mongol sack just a few decades earlier, was again heavily depopulated, this time by plague. By the year 1348, the plague was also in Damascus. Now, Damascus may have had as many as 100,000 inhabitants and was the regional capital of Mamluk power in Syria. But now death was here. Ten people died in a day. The next day, 30 people. The day after, 50 people. Soon, 2,000 people were gone every 24 hours. In the end, only 50,000 people remained here. But it's here in Damascus where we actually have a detailed account from someone who, most likely, was there when the plague hit. This was a man by the name of Ibn Battuta, who we've mentioned here and met here on the show before. If you'll remember, Ibn Battuta is often called the Islamic version of Marco Polo, but I think it would be much more accurate if we flipped that and said Marco Polo is the Christian version of Ibn Battuta. Uh, but that, it doesn't really matter. Ibn Battuta was amazing because he traveled all throughout the known world in his lifetime. Sub-Saharan Africa, Egypt, Arabia, the Middle East, through Central Asia, maybe as far as India, China, and Indonesia... He's quite an incredible guy, and he left a very detailed account of his journeys. But on one of his return journeys westward, on his way to visit the holy city of Mecca, he stopped in Damascus in 1348. That's right, the year of the plague. And thankfully, Ibn Battuta survived the plague, and his memories and his journals lived on, thank goodness. But it's from him that we get a, a few details on how the inhabitants of the city acted. Ibn Battuta writes, the people fasted for three successive days, the last of which was a Thursday. At the end of this period, all the classes of people assembled in the great mosque until it was filled to overflowing with them. And they spent Thursday night there in prayers and liturgies and supplications. Then, after performing the dawn prayer, they all went out together on foot, carrying Qurans in their hands. The emirs, too, were there and barefooted. The entire population of the city joined in exodus, male and female, small and large. The Jews went out with their book of the law, and the Christians also with their gospel. Their women and children with them, the whole concourse of them in tears and humble supplications, imploring the favor of God through his book and his prophets. I really love this description of how everybody of all faiths unite in probably the worst situation imaginable. It's kind of a beautiful scene in some ways. But of course, the darker side is that congregation means widespread infection, and Damascus is going to pay a heavy price. East of Syria, the poor people of Iraq and Persia were in no shape or form ready for the disaster. I mean, nobody was, but them especially. These were the areas that had been hit hardest by the Mongol invasions and subsequent wars just a few years earlier. They had barely begun to rebuild when they're walloped with this plague. Roughly 30% of the population from the ruins of Baghdad to the gates of Samarkand was killed. But the death rate in cities was much higher. In some places as high as anywhere between 40 and 70%. And what makes this all so much worse is that out in the countryside people are dying, crops aren't being gathered, there's no harvest, and so people flee to the cities for food. And then once they're in the cities, they often get infected and die. Persia and Iraq and some of the surrounding regions were already mostly depopulated uh, anywhere other than the cities, again, thanks to the Mongol invasions. If you're a farmer and the Mongols come, you are going to flee to the city. But after the Black Death, the rural depopulation greatly accelerated, leaving entire regions here just empty, devoid of humans for miles and miles and miles. All in all, Anywhere between 30 and 45% of the population of the Islamic world was gone. Now, I want to read a quote from a Tunisian historian from, from this time in history. But this man is special because, well, okay, look, we're here. We are at the time of Timur. 
I know our narrative hasn't really gotten to him yet, but we're finally at a place where we're meeting people who will not only live during the life of Timur, and will not only write things about him, but in some cases they'll even meet him. This great Tunisian scholar and traveler known as Ibn Khaldun is one such character, and we will be hearing a lot from him along the whole journey. For Ibn Khaldun will not only meet Timur, he'll actually be captured by Timur, although in a much less violent way than I made that sound. Anyway, Ibn Khaldun is one of the most incredible guys of the, the entire medieval era. I know this term usually refers to a different time in history, but Ibn Khaldun was a true renaissance man. He, he did everything. He studied and wrote about sociology, demographics, politics, history, religion, philosophy, science, and interestingly enough, is considered a forerunner or early father of modern economic theory. Oh, and on top of all this, he travels across much of the known world at the time, which yes, does mean that he eventually runs into Timur. But before all of this, Ibn Khaldun was born in the city of Tunis in Tunisia in the year 1332. Which means when the plague hit the city of Tunis in 1348, Ibn Khaldun was there and was probably only about 16 years old. And as he watched his friends, most of his teachers, his mother and his father all die from the plague, he remembered. And he later wrote about the plague's ma uh, macro impact on the Islamic world, and it's an excellent summary of what we've covered. Here's what he says. Civilization, both in the East and the West, was visited by a destructive plague which devastated nations and caused populations to vanish. It swallowed up many of the good things of civilization and wiped them out. It overtook the dynasties of the time, when they had reached the limit of their duration. It lessened their power and curtailed their influence. It weakened their authority. Their station approached the point of annihilation and disillusion. Civilization decreased with the decrease of mankind. Cities and buildings were laid waste, roads and way signs were obliterated, settlements and mansions became empty, and dynasties and tribes grew weak. The entire inhabited world changed. It was as if the voice of existence in the world had called out for oblivion and restriction, and the world responded to its call. God inherits the earth, and whoever is upon it. Now, those are words from a man who lived through this horrifying event that I can never imagine. So, to finish today's episode off, we need to spend a bit of time getting into the heads of the people who lived and died through the Black Death's reign. And this is where things get really interesting, because although the Christian and Islamic world shared many of the same reactions to the plague, there also existed quite a few differences between these two groups. We'll talk about the Christian responses first. In the Christian Bible, which is the collection of holy scriptures, plagues show up quite a bit, but primarily in one of two ways. First of all, the Bible has many accounts of plagues being sent by God to punish either the enemies of his people, or even his own people at times, in order to get them back onto the correct path. Uh, the ten plagues of Egypt are probably the most infamous of this type of plagues, sent by God to punish the Egyptians, and so on and so forth. So basically, with this interpretation, plague is a punishment sent by God. And as such, much of the Christian world saw the Black Death as punishment for, well, fill in the blank. Adultery, war, killing fellow Christians, allowing Jews to live in the same land as you, laziness, anything. But the other main way in which plague appears in the Bible is at the very end of the book in the section of Revelations. Which, if you don't know... Revelations is a book of prophecies outlining how the world is going to end according to common Christian tradition. Now, this book was and is very contentious. Uh, how many Christians are there in the world today? Maybe three billion, roughly? Well, then there are probably about three billion interpretations of the book of Revelations. But regardless, if we take the literal, literal interpretation, then the end of the world is not going to be a fun time. Tons of horrible wars, demons taking over, oppressive governments, earthquakes and storms, widespread famine, and tons and tons of plague. What does this mean for where we are in the story? Well, many Christians viewed the Black Death as the end of the world, the apocalypse. Now, there were all sorts of other views, of course, but generally Christians saw the Black Death as either a punishment, or the end times, or some mixture of the two. But now let's look at the Islamic world. 
There were certainly Muslims who shared both of those two views. There were also, as with the Christians, a large movement of people who reverted to the old pagan ways and mysticism, or they combined paganism with their monotheist theology. But here's where things differ. Now again, religion is very complicated, and there are tons of various interpretations, and I am by no means an expert on this. But the Hadith does talk about how obedient Muslims should view plague. The Hadith is believed by most Muslims to be an account of the words and actions of the Prophet Muhammad and his life, peace be upon him. As such, it's pretty high up there on the issue of authority. And on the issue of plague in particular, here's what the Hadith has to say at one point. Aisha reported, she asked the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, about plagues, and he said, It is a punishment that Allah sends upon you whatever he wills, but... Allah has made it a mercy for the believers. Any servant who resides in a land afflicted by the plague, remaining patient and hoping for reward from Allah, knowing that nothing will befall him but what Allah has decreed, he will be given the reward of a martyr. So yes, plague can be a punishment, but if you are faithful and obedient and the plague kills you, then you're a holy martyr. Plague could even be seen as a mercy sent from on high to allow Muslims into paradise. Now, I know not everyone agrees with this, but this was, at the time, one of the most commonly held views. As such, many Muslims were instructed not to flee the plague, but to accept it, and to help those who needed help, and to accept the will of Allah. Now, was this universally the opinion? Of course not, but it does seem to be one of the most prevalent opinions that the plague was sent to allow for holy martyrdom. Anyway, I wanted to touch on that difference because I found it interesting but that pretty much wraps up what I have. I might make a part two of what the Black Death uh, did to the Middle East and Central Asia. The problem with, with this subject is there aren't as many sources as I would like. Uh, they're out there. They, they certainly are. But I don't have access to many of them. Uh, and there's actually one book that every source I used referred to this book. And I can't get this book. It's rare. It's very expensive. Um... Yeah, everywhere I found it, it was well over $60, which is money I don't have at the moment, but once I do, I will buy this book, I will read it, and I'll probably make a part two somewhere on down the line about the Black Death. One last thought that I had is, well, this episode really made me think a lot about just generational disasters. Here's what I mean. Here in America, it's pretty easy to find these types of families that you just can't help feel are unlucky in this sort of brutal way. Thankfully, my family was spared because of the various ages of my ancestors and when they were born, but let me explain. It's very easy here to find Americans whose great-grandparents lived through the Spanish flu and fought in World War I. And then their grandparents suffered the Great Depression and fought in World War II, and their parents maybe fought in Vietnam or the Gulf War, or you get the point. And I know that part of this is just the human experience and that we all have to live through horrible things, but I can't help but imagine families back then who were in this similar doomed situation. Maybe your great-great-grandfather died defending the city of Baghdad from the Mongols, then your great-grandfather and grandfather were both conscripted and forced to fight for the Ilkhanate army in one of its many wars, then your father was enlisted and killed by a Mamluk arrow, and now you are watching your friends and neighbors and beloved family members brutally killed by an unseen entity, the Black Death. And you'll live. You'll actually have a son but your son will be forced to join an army of the ever-expanding empire led by a man that they call Timur. But with that, thank you for listening to this long and very bleak episode of the Timur podcast. I know it's a lot to think about, and I've been pretty moody while preparing it this last week. But anyway, next week we'll get back to looking at the history of the four Khanates. We only have one left, and that is the Chagatai Khanate. And then the week after that, two weeks from today, if all goes well, and I think that it should, we will look at the birth of Timur. As always, feel free to reach out to me at any time for any reason. I really love hearing your thoughts, your questions, and your feedback. You can reach me at any time on Facebook at TimurPod, on Twitter at Podcast Timur, via email at TimurPodcast at gmail.com, or check out the website at TimurPodcast.com. 
Thanks again for listening, and we will see you next week right here on the Timber Podcast. Thank you.